Okay, hello everyone. Good morning. 10.30. We're going to start on topic four today. And uh, today we're going to talk about protists and fungi. So uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, weird binomial scientific names here for you. Probably a few diseases you haven't heard of before. Some of them are tropical, some of them are found in Canada. Um, so let's take a look at these. And uh, kind of we're going to just going to start off and finish um, we're going to go back to comparing prokaryotes and eukaryotes. If you remember last week, we were talking about the prokaryotes, so the bacteria, they had no nucleus. And today we're going to talk about uh, eukaryotes uh, this week and um, today and Thursday. So a couple of things about those prokaryotes. You may remember that the bacterial cell wall was made out of peptidoglycan, and we talked about the gram negatives and the gram positives. So the eukaryotes, if you take a look at the uh, cell wall, uh, there is quite a bit of variety. We uh, had mentioned animal cells don't have a cell wall. Um, fungal cells do. They have a cell wall made of something called chitin. And uh, as for protists, which we're going to be talking about today, um, there's actually a huge variety of substances for the cell walls, and it's kind of not really worth getting into um, in a lot of detail, although I may mention it here or there. So just one of the big differences. Uh, something else we talked about is reproduction. So we had talked about how bacteria reproduce by binary fission and they can exchange DNA uh, through a process called conjugation, also called bacterial sex, and that's through a sex pillus. Uh, eukaryotes, there is a variety of ways for them to reproduce. Uh, some are asexual, some are sexual, uh, some can do both, some do one or the other, it kind of depends on the organism. Uh, it gets really complicated when you get to protists and when you get to fungi, and uh, so I will be uh, not really getting into it in a lot of detail, but just, just a little bit uh, here and there. Okay. So, back to our picture of a eukaryotic cell. Uh, you may remember we were talking about all the different types of organelles and some of the other uh, cell features. Uh, I'm not going to talk about lysosomes today, that's more for when we talk about the immune system. Uh, I want to point out obviously we have a nucleus here for a eukaryotic cell. And we're going to talk about these uh, cilia today, cilia and flagella. So these are different than the bacterial flagella. And uh, I'll show you some pictures and some videos shortly here. So when we look at our eukaryotes, we're going to really break it into two topics. Uh, today we're going to talk about mostly uh, unicellular organisms, so protists and fungi. I um, kind of debated whether I should separate them into two units, but it kind of fits into one lecture. And then on Thursday, we're going to talk about multicellular cellular eukaryotic parasites. So really mostly we're going to talk about worms and a few other uh, creepy crawlies on Thursday. So bring your best stomach to Thursday's lecture. because. Uh, it's going to get a little gross. So if I can find them, I'm going to go to the biology lab and find you some specimens to show you as well. We have quite a few uh, specimens in the biology lab. So what is the one thing we can say about protists? They are diverse. Um, it's very easy to define what an animal is. It's very easy to define what a fungi is. Protist is kind of, uh, well, it just doesn't fit into those other categories. It's not a plant. It's not an animal. It's not a fungi, uh, but it is a eukaryote. Uh, we can say that most of them are single cell, and uh, many of them are motile. So uh, kind of traditionally, people used to use the word protozoan, which kind of means animal-like, uh, meaning it moves around. Uh, a lot of biologists don't like that term because some of them are animal-like and plant-like. They are photosynthetic, and they can move around, and so it's kind of a weird term to use. Uh, but medically, it's stuck. And people still talk about protozoan parasites, protozoans uh, all the time in the medical community. So we're going to use that term uh, for protists. We're going to use the term protozoan. On Thursday, we're going to use the term uh, metazoan. So what is a metazoan? Metazoan means a larger animal parasite. So usually we're talking about worms when we talk about metazoans. So here's a variety here. We're going to talk about all of these ones here except for uh, leishmania. Uh, in this class, uh, but the rest of them we are going to talk about and we're going to introduce in today's lecture. So you can see, like I said, they come in a, in a huge variety of shapes and sizes. 
what's going on here. I'm trying to advance my slide. Okay, so first thing to point out is that many of these things have, um, uh oh, restart the program. It says, oh, never mind. Looks like it's working. Um, many of them have flagella and cilia. So you may remember we we're talking about the bacterial flagella, and I gave you that demonstration and how you know the bacteria turn around or the flagella turn around. Um, these are actually very different structures. Same word, uh, flagella, um, but it's much, much larger, the structure. And they don't spin around like propellers. Uh, they actually flap up and down like big whips or big uh, floppy paddles, however you want to um, picture it. You can see there's a video there of Giardia. And Giardia has multiple flagella. And you see they're sort of uh, flapping back and forth like, like big whips. And uh, so, like I said, they're very, very different structures. They're actually surrounded by a membrane. They're powered by ATP. Uh, makes it a very different structure than a bacterial uh, flagella. Uh, so what's a cilia? I'll show you a picture of some cilia in a minute. Cilia are kind of uh, almost exactly like flagella, but they're just smaller. So if you think of flagella like a big whip-like tail, cilia are more like little finger-like whips. So there's a couple of pictures. You can see the uh, flagellum. Uh, like I said, on the left there is much larger. It's uh, it's kind of you know the length of the cell or, or longer. Uh, the cilia are, are very much smaller, uh, and they're kind of like little fingers. So picture having a whole bunch of little paddlers uh, as opposed to one big whip paddle kind of thing. So I'll show you. I know some videos here. Um, where are my videos? Let me just take a quick look here. Wonder if they're they're coming up. Uh, hmm, somehow I skipped the slide with my videos, so let me just go back to that slide here. There it is. Okay. Just make sure I'm sharing this the right screen. There we go. Sorry about that. I guess I just skipped a slide by accident. Um, yeah, so you can see there on uh, the top video, that's a flagella. Uh, that's a sperm cell, and uh, it's much larger than the cell body and looks very much like a whip. Uh, the one on the bottom, that's a paramecium. And I know it's really hard to tell in that video, but if you take a very careful look, you can see uh, around the edge of the paramecium, uh, you kind of see a little bit of a blur going on. And what is going on is you've got all these little uh, cilia and they're kind of just, they're like, like I said, little tiny mini paddles and allowing it to move through, uh, move through its environment. So cilia and flagella, okay? So these are structures for motility and uh, most of these protists have, uh, you know, one or the other, not all, but most of them do. And it helps them move around, helps them to be pathogenic and move to different body tissues, which is, is very bad for us. So there's the uh, Giardia again with its, uh, with its flagella. And there's the pictures that I showed you before. So what else can we say about these uh, protists is that many of them have complex life cycles. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about life cycles in more detail on Thursday when we're talking about the worms. Um, but it's, it's important to know that their life cycles are complex. And what does that mean? It means they have different stages. Uh, some of the stages can be sexual, some of them can be asexual stages, some of them uh, require multiple hosts. Uh, especially, particularly when we get to worms, you're going to see it can get very, very complex. Here's, here's one life cycle here shown on the left. This is uh, the plasmodium life cycle. Plasmodium is the organism that causes malaria. And if you know a little bit about malaria, you probably know that malaria is transmitted by a mosquito. And so it turns out that the sexual part of the life cycle actually happens in the mosquito in the salivary glands. Uh, the human stages happen in the liver and the blood, and those are actually asexual stages. And you can see uh, on the slide here, they've all got different names that you don't need to know all the names. We've got uh, merozoite, sporozite, uh, gametocyte, uh, et cetera. I, I don't expect you to know all those, those names. Um, but for malaria, mosquito is important, uh, even if you uh, don't know the names of all the stages. And like I said, some of these are very, very complex. So we'll come back to plasmodium in a few minutes. 
Uh, there's our Giardia again, and uh, many of them have something called cysts as part of their uh, life cycle. So what is a cyst? A cyst is kind of like a bacterial endospore. Uh, it's where the organism encases itself and uh, uh, kind of goes dormant. Uh, they're not as tough as bacterial endospores. Remember, bacterial endospores can last 50 years easily. Uh, these are probably more like a season or two. Um, but still tough enough, Giardia in particular, for example, uh, is resistant to chlorination, the Giardia cysts. Uh, so if you've ever been in a city or a town that's had a boil water advisory, um, often it's Giardia uh, has gotten into the water and uh, it, they know it's, uh, it's uh, resistant to chlorination treatments. So they're telling you to boil the water just in case uh, so that you don't get sick from the Giardia. So you can see on that slide it says we've got cysts, We've got O cysts and we've got O O cysts. That's how you say it. Two O, so we say O O cyst. So, so what's the difference? Again, uh, just some particularities in terms of the biology. Um, a cyst is an encapsulated layer. An O cyst kind of has an extra protective coat, and so it's a little tougher than a than a normal cyst. And an O O cyst actually has two extra layers of protection on it, and it's tougher than an O cyst and tougher than a normal cyst. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much. Just know that cysts are, are tough, dormant, encapsulated structures, and uh, they, uh, uh, they're important for transmission, and sometimes they're, they're hard, to, uh, hard to kill by processes like water treatment. Uh, so here's a, here's a picture showing a, a, a life cycle that is involving uh, some sort of uh, cyst. You can see you've got a... a Trophozoite, that's the active feeding, growing uh, stage of the organism that's found at the top uh, here. So I think I can circle that with my pen. There's the trophozoite. Like I said, it's kind of an active feeding vegetative stage. And, um, and then, you know, these, environment, these uh, organisms live out in the environment. Uh, they dry up and they form these cysts. And it sits there and rests and maybe ends up in your, in your water and, and then um, maybe you drink it later. So there's three organisms here. You see Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Entamoeba histolytica we'll talk about uh, shortly. And these all form cysts. Okay, so I want to talk, uh, this, or, this uh, lecture mostly we're just talking about the different organisms. And I apologize, they have some, some names that are kind of, you know, scientific jargon and all that. And again, I don't expect you to know all the phylums, which is shown on this particular slide here. Uh, know the organisms, and know that these organisms, um, they do have common names, but it's really important that you do know the, um, they, that we do know the uh, uh, scientific name uh, for all these organisms. I see there's a question here. Someone says, is it the same as a Bartholin cyst? And I'm not familiar with what a Bartholin cyst is, so you may have to Google that one. Let me know if you find out what, what that means. I know there are other forms of cysts cysts that we talk about medically. Uh, sometimes people get a cyst in their body and maybe they're concerned it's, uh, it's a, a lump of cancer or, or something like that. Cyst kind of generally means lump and so it can be used in different, uh, uh, different contexts biologically. So like I said, sometimes people are concerned about a cyst that they have in their body and they're concerned it's cancerous. We can talk about protozoan cysts. We can also talk about parasite cysts, where sometimes they actually you know, form little lumps and hide in your body as well, maybe in your brain or your muscle tissue. And we're going to talk about that next week uh, when we talk about the worms. So this slide here is just showing a bit of a classification scheme. Like I said, don't worry too much about the names on this particular slide. Worry about the names of the actual organisms. Uh, but notice it's saying how, you know, they're classified by you know, their motility, right? So lots of them are flagellates, which means they have flagella. And that's kind of a term that people will use uh, when they're talking about um, protists. They'll talk about there's a, you know, some sort of flagellate. And, and what they really mean is, is, that, is they're talking about a protist that, that has flagella and is motile. So there's another question that says, so we need to know the names such as amoebozoa, et cetera. And uh, what is the motility, technically everything. Uh, like I said, don't worry about the names on this particular slide. 
worry about the names of the exact organisms. And uh, each of them usually have a couple of things unique to them that will hopefully help you remember a little bit of things about their biology. And we'll try to point that out as we talk about them. Okay, so let's get in and talk about these things here. Uh, first group here, um, I see there's another question. What actual organisms though? Well, we're gonna talk about them right now. So you take a look at this slide, we've got the diplomonads. I don't care about that word. What I care about is that you know this word here. Oops, I meant to circle it. Giardia lamblia and Trichomonas vaginalis. So those are the words I want you to know, the names of the organisms. Like I said, they do have common names, some of them as well, uh, but most of them are, are uh, primarily known by their, uh, uh, by their scientific names. So let's take a look at Giardia first, Giardia lamblia. Uh, Giardia lamblia, sometimes I see in the literature is also known as Giardia intestinalis, which I actually think is a better name because it's uh, telling you that it has a, uh, gives you a intestinal infection. Uh, but most people are calling it either just Giardia or Giardia lamblia. So if you remember Giardia, you'll hopefully remember uh, what this thing is. So this thing is unique, it has two nuclei, and you can see it kind of looks like a crazy alien. It's got these flagella, and uh, you can see there's that video of it swimming around. Uh, and I already talked about this one as, uh, as being resistant to uh, chlorination, or at least the cysts are resistant to chlorination, uh, which makes it a, an issue in uh, sometimes contaminated drinking water. Uh, I have some other pictures here for you. I was going to show you this if you're looking for a Halloween costume idea. I found this on the internet. This lady here was uh, dressed as Giardia for uh, Halloween. So a little bit about this organism. You can see there's the life cycle. Uh, the main thing about the life cycle to know is, uh, is this here, right? It forms cysts and the cysts can end up in drinking water. Uh, so where does this happen? Um, this happens when people sometimes they go camping. Uh, maybe they're drinking uh, water that's been contaminated by uh, uh, the feces of animals, or sometimes, like I said, we have these boil water advisories. In my hometown, for example, uh, one spring there was, um, uh, I think there was actually uh, uh, some sort of flooding from a swamp that ended up in the water reservoir, and they were concerned about, uh, uh, actually it was beavers, uh, I believe they were concerned about beaver feces getting into the water reservoir, and so they had a, a boil water advisory and they were concerned about, uh, about Giardia. Um, you can see that sometimes Giardia is actually called beaver fever um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have to do with actual beavers, it just has to do with animal feces uh, that are, are contaminating uh, drinking water. So the cysts end up in the drinking water, uh, ends up in the humans, and the humans uh, usually get some sort of diarrhea uh, and, uh, you know, it usually lasts a couple of weeks or more. So sometimes people get this as a form of traveler's diarrhea. Uh, so maybe you, you're going to another country for a holiday, uh, Mexico or something like that. And sometimes it's E. coli, and we'll talk about E. coli traveler's diarrhea. Um, but uh, if you have the diarrhea and it lasts for at least two weeks, uh, then this is probably what you have is giardia. Uh, sometimes, interestingly, uh, Giardia actually manifests itself as you have diarrhea for a day or two, and then you have constipation for a day or two, and then you have diarrhea for a day or two. Not exactly sure how that works. Uh, there's probably a biological mechanism behind it, but that seems to be uh, and sometimes the case. Like I said, usually lasts for a week or two or more. So there's a couple of questions here, and someone says, I wouldn't wish beaver fever on my worst enemy. Oh yeah, I, sure, I hear it's awful. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes people's dogs get it, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, somebody says, how do these things survive the extreme acidity of the stomach? Does the stomach kill some or most? Well, actually, the answer is that this is exactly how this organism is designed to survive the stomach. That's why it forms the cyst. Uh, it lives out in the environment uh, as the trophozoite, and then it forms the cyst, and the cyst has that extra thick layer and, um, and it's able to uh, uh, go through the stomach. In fact, the acid of the stomach is actually a signal for it to germinate once it hits the intestine. It's, a, it's sort of like a signal to say, okay, time to grow soon, kind of thing. Uh, someone says, uh, is there a vaccine for this? I do not believe there is a vaccine for 
uh, for Giardia, unfortunately. Um, mostly it's, it's water treatment, uh, that kind of thing. Um, there are, is a traveler's diarrhea vaccine. Uh, I don't think it's that effective and it's mostly for, um, it's mostly for uh, pathogenic E. coli. That's uh, the Duke girl somebody's making reference to. Someone says, what gives it energy if it has no mitochondria? Uh, well, it's a parasite. So it's taking energy from its host. And uh, so that's, you know, a lot of parasites are kind of windy organisms because they, uh, they just, they're living in a nutrient risk rich um, organism, such as a human. So Giardia is pretty common, like I said, uh, with these boiled water advisories and sometimes it's traveler's diarrhea, but, but like I said, it's kind of the traveler's diarrhea that people have the last couple of weeks. Most traveler's diarrhea is a form of pathogenic E. coli and it clears up within three to four days. Um, but if you have something that's lasting, uh, you know, like I said, two weeks or more, this is probably what you have and there are pills for it. Someone says, what is the purpose of the two nuclei? Um, I have no idea. Um, there's a lot of weird things going on with these protists, and, uh, and um, there's probably somebody who has a hypothetical answer to that, but we, we probably don't really know the full answer. Um, some of these protists do, uh, 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 you, you can see that Giardia is, uh, reproduces asexually, um, but some of these do uh, involve themselves in, in various forms of conjugation. And I'm not sure about Giardia in particular, but there are some protists that actually will donate the nuclei to another protist. And that's their form of, uh, it's not sexual reproduction, but it is sex, which means they're exchanging DNA. And I'm not sure if that's the case with Giardia. So I did mention that this is common sometimes with dogs. Um, so I have, a, I have a colleague and he has these uh, chocolate labs. And uh, he, he talks about these dogs more than most people talk about their kids. They really are his babies. And uh, to really an, an extreme extent, and we're both biologists, and so I, I, he must feel comfortable talking to me about this. But, you know, the one dog seems to get diarrhea a lot. And uh, he's always telling them about it in excruciating amount of detail. And, uh, uh, of course, like, it's, it's not that bad. I, I'm always curious as to wondering, you know, the patterns around his dog getting diarrhea. And I'm pretty sure his dogs have had uh, Giardia a number of times. And so uh, what is going on here? Well, dogs, you know, they drink out of puddles and storm ponds and things like that. And, and typically what happens uh, in the spring is there's animals that have these parasites. Uh, the parasites, of course, survive as cysts. And in the spring, um, the melt happens and, and you know, everything kind of travels downhill. And ends up in these ponds, and some, sometimes the dogs end up getting uh, sick from these from these parasites. Okay, I can see there's another question. Someone says, "My dog drinks every lake and puddle and pond of water they find." Of course, they do. The dogs are thirsty. They love being out in the wild, and you know it doesn't happen all the time, but uh, enough that uh, you know this is a pretty common problem that vets see is this diarrhea in these people. Of course, someone's dog has diarrhea and it's lasting. Two, three weeks, they're very concerned. And of course, uh, uh, you know, there's the smell. And, uh, you know, my understanding is Giardia uh, has a pretty bad kind of rotten egg kind of smell to it as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's not that pleasant to be cleaning up after your dog. So that's Giardia, also known as beaver fever. And uh, so we don't want it. <laughs> Okay, so another um, parasite, which is kind of loosely related to Giardia, this is called a Trichomonas. Giardia, by the way, is pretty common in Canada. I know often when people think about parasites, you know, thinking about tropical foreign countries, um, but uh, Giardia, pretty common in Canada, and probably more common for your dog than uh, as, as a person. Um, here's another really common uh, parasite found in Canada and developed countries, and this is called Trichomonas vaginalis. Uh, so this is a sexually transmitted disease, and in fact, it's the only protist um, that we know of that is sexually transmitted, at least normally. Uh, there's sort of some exceptions. Um, we'll talk about that uh, uh, shortly. Um, so trichomonas is very common. In fact, it's so common we have no idea how common it is. And why is it so common? Because a very high percentage of people don't have symptoms. So maybe 60, 70% of women don't have any symptoms. 
and a very high percentage of men, like greater than 90% of men, have, have no symptoms whatsoever. So it's transmitted very, very easily, and uh, people have it and they don't know it. Um, the good thing about trichomonas is it's not as nasty as some other sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, you're getting kind of uh, typical symptoms, so maybe uh, pain or discomfort with urination, uh, sometimes discharges, uh, both men and women, um, uh, either discharges vaginally or, or during ejaculation or, or uh, discharges, you know, cloudy urine and, and things like that. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, di the huge disadvantage of trichomonas is it does make people more susceptible to other sexually transmitted infections. Uh, particularly if people have trichomonas, uh, they're way more susceptible to getting HIV if they get exposed. Um, there are some cases, actually this was a relatively recent discovery, there have been some cases of trichomonas actually being spread uh, mother to daughter during childbirth. Uh, and that is something that's kind of, uh, uh, kind of interesting as well, because uh, it, was, it was thought that this was only transmitted sexually until, until relatively very recently. Uh, I see there's another question here. Uh, okay, maybe it disappeared, so never mind. Okay, so what else can we say about trichomonas? I thought I had another slide here for you about trichomonas. Oh, there we go. So there's a little video here. I think it's just swimming around. Oh, media not found. Oh, sorry about that. It wasn't the best video, but uh, you can see them swimming around. These things here, let me just go back the slide. I can't seem to dance my slides. These things do have these flagellums, and they do have something called an undulating membrane, which kind of means their whole body flaps when they swim around, uh, which makes them kind of creepy looking. Uh, anything else here? So I think I said all this already. Like I said, infected men are usually asymptomatic. Um, we're not sure what the numbers are. Uh, if you look up number one sexually transmitted disease and number two sexually transmitted disease, usually those lists will say gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, some people think this is actually more common, but it's really hard to measure because so many people that have had it didn't even know they had it uh, because of the asymptomatic part. But uh, um, so. And, and thankfully, unlike gonorrhea and chlamydia, it's not usually causing sterility in the, se uh, in the sexes, which, which is another good thing. Uh, people have it, they have the itch. Um, that's sometimes, you know, sometimes people call it the trick itch, and, and there's a few other names for that. Trick is another name for trichomonas, uh, and, and it's relatively easily treatable. So I found this, by the way, this was on Wired magazine, and uh, so uh, trichomonas, um, there's a number of parasites that fall into that category, uh, and, and some of them are, uh, well, the one that infects humans is, is sexually transmitted, but there's a lot of animals that get um, these kind of parasites, and uh, it seems that uh, probably Tyrannosaurus rexes were in that category of animals that got trichomonas. So you can see this is an artist's uh, image of, um, showing this parasite and the wounds kind of on the face. And, uh, and so there are some species of, of uh, lizards today that get a similar type of parasite. So this person was analyzing uh, Tyrannosaurus uh, uh, skulls and found these wounds, you can see marked by the arrows, uh, on, on some of the skulls. And uh, they're proposing that this is actually some sort of trichomonas infection. They, they figured they would get these probably you know, of course, we don't really fully know everything about Tyrannosaurus rexes, but the thought was that they would either wrestle, whether you know, due to mating practices, or maybe the, the males would fight over the females and have contact with their, with their faces, and that's how the parasite spread. So I thought that was kind of interesting. There are tons and tons of people interested in uh, animals out in the wild and study parasites because uh, they're very important um, out in the, out in the ecosystems uh, for a lot of uh, different organisms, parasites, very important. Okay, so another group are the euglenozoids. Um, I thought I'd show you these pictures. Euglenas are, uh, are great organisms for undergraduate biology labs. Uh, I usually look at them every semester. They're, uh, many of them are photosynthetic. Uh, you can see uh, these videos I found. <laughs> they're called, uh, the one video on YouTube is called the Euglena Party. Uh, yeah, they look like they're having a party. They look like they're having a lot of fun. Uh, these ones here are not parasitic. Like I said, they're just interesting to look at. 
Um, but you can see they're swimming around. They've got little flagella. And um, there are euglenoids that, that are parasitic, though, that are very uh, closely related to these. And the big group are these ones here called the kinetoplastids. Uh, and what does that mean? That means they have a giant chloroplast. Uh, again, it's a, it's a word you don't need to worry about. It's the organisms that I care about the most. So the organisms that we're concerned with here are called the trypanosomes. So these organisms here are not found in Canada, um, at least not normally anyway. Uh, sometimes people do import them because they're coming from other countries. Um, but these are important worldwide organisms and uh, they're important uh, due to uh, certain geographical restrictions. So you can see these two organisms here, the trypanosomes, we've got trypanosome brucei, named after a guy named Bruce, so I think he was studying the organism, and trypanosome cruzi, so I don't know if that was named after somebody else as well, I'm not really sure. Um, but these infect the blood, and these are really, really creepy looking organisms. Uh, and uh, they, they kind of do some creepy things too. So uh, I'll show you a little bit about them. Um, here's the interesting thing about them. Both of these organisms are transmitted by insects. And so this is why we don't have them in Canada because we don't have these particular insects. So the one on the left, Trypanosoma brucei, uh, that transmits something that is known as African sleeping sickness. And it is spread by something called the tsetse fly. And so it kind of looks like a weird uh, house fly, and uh, the tsetse fly is found only on the African continent. So this fly is actually associated with wildlife. Uh, this is one of these diseases we will never get rid of until we, unless we kill all the wildlife. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. And uh, it, it's, a, it's an animal, an animal kind of disease, and humans sometimes, well, we interact with wildlife, whether on farms or or in the wild, and uh, the flies uh, bite the humans. Parasite gets into the blood, and uh, you know people end up with kind of early stages. They'll end up with relatively typical disease-like symptoms, so headaches and and uh, you know cramps and fatigue and and, and those kind of things. Um, and uh, there's actually a couple versions of this disease, by the way. One in West Africa, one in East Africa. I can never remember which is which. Uh, one of them is slow, it takes years. One of them is quick, it takes, uh, I think, a month or two. Um, but generally, eventually, the parasite gets into the brain, and the people end up, you know, much more fatigued and eventually end up in a coma, and they never awake from the coma, they eventually die. Um, this is a very bad disease. This is one of these few diseases out there that uh, if you do not get treatment, your chances of death are basically 100%. Um, and it's another disease, unfortunately, too, that there have been no new drugs in like for decades uh, for this disease. And the drugs themselves are relatively uh, toxic uh, chemicals. Um, so most of the treatment now, if, if you get it early on, it's better uh, and, and you have a better chance of success. So a lot of the treatment actually for this is preventative. Um, so you're, you're doing uh, insect control. Uh, for example, one of the ways they control the insects is they have these little traps, and these little traps emit carbon dioxide that attracts the insects, and then the insects get in there and die in the trap. And so you can do this and, and prevent a lot of illness that way, is what the farmers do. Uh, the one on the right here, um, the, uh, um, let's see, there's a question here. Someone says, trick. Okay, so they must have been for a trichomonas, yeah. Um, so the one on the right, uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, causes Chagas disease. Let me just see if I have another slide for that one. Yeah, I do. I'll come back to that in a second because uh, I have a video for you. Uh, this one is found in the other side of the ocean. So we're talking about the Americas. Uh, so mostly we're talking about tropical and subtropical Americas. So South America and uh, uh, Latin America. But it does transmit uh, in the United States. People were in denial of this for quite some time, but it is, is transmitting in the States. And there's been a bit of a panic over it over the last few years. So I'll play this little video for you and, and we'll come back to uh, some of the information on Chavez disease in a moment. But let me play this video for you. I found uh, it sums up uh, Chavez disease very nicely. So it's just a two minute video here. And you can see this is 2012. And there was a headline in the New York Times in 2012, and they were calling Chagas disease the new AIDS, or the new 
HIV. And so, of course, this got a lot of people's attention because they're like, what now? Um, this sounds kind of scary. So I'll play this for you, and, uh, and then I'll have a few other things to say about uh, Chaga's disease. So here it goes. Hold on, I've got to make sure we have volume. There we go. All right, let's try that now. We're hearing reports today about a medical mystery some scientists are calling the new AIDS of the Americas. The name of the illness is Chagas disease. You can treat it, but you cannot cure it. It can be fatal, and researchers say it's spreading now at an alarming rate. Trace Gallagher has the details from our West Coast newsroom. Trace? But to treat it, Megan, you got to catch it early enough. And the problem is, just like AIDS, Chagas is very hard to detect, and it has this long incubation period with no symptoms. What happens is these blood-sucking insects actually send a parasite into your blood, right? And it releases the parasite, and then it makes its way to your heart, where it can actually multiply. It's called a kissing bug. It stays dormant for years, and then it shows up as heart disease, potentially a heart attack. As many as 8 million people have Chagas, mostly shows up in impoverished areas like Bolivia, Mexico, and Central America. But experts now estimate that 30,000 people in this country are effective. Most of those are immigrants. Now, it can be passed through blood transfusions, or you can pass it on to your children. It has similarities to the early spread of HIV. Here's Dr. Manny Alvarez. Listen. What we have to realize is that the diseases of the tropics, which is in our backyard, um, and there are, there are many of them, right, um, are becoming more prevalent in the U.S., and I think that's a factor because the world is opening up more. Right. Can't really get rid of this thing. You have to diagnose it and then treat it. We should point out that Charles Darwin, you know, theory of evolution, his death has been a medical mystery for a very long time. And now there's a lot of new research that says it's possible that that man also died of Chagas, Megan, becoming much more prevalent in this country, which is a frightening scenario. It really is. Gosh, Trace, thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I'll just get back to the PowerPoint here. So, yeah, you can see a little bit of information about Chagas disease there. Um, it... Uh, my understanding is it is treatable if it's caught early, but often a lot of people are, are asymptomatic. So um, how much do we need to worry about it? Thankfully, it's not caused by any insect uh, that is in Canada, um, but a group of uh, these insects, and they, they refer to them in the video as the kissing bugs. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, reduvid bugs, and there's a, there's a few different names for some of these species. And uh, so why are they called the kissing bugs? Um, it turns out that they like to bite people in their sleep, and, um, and then they're attracted to, you know, your lips are emitting carbon dioxide, they're attracted to carbon dioxide, plus they like that soft tissue around your lips. So that's where they bite, right? And uh, as, they, as they feed, uh, they defecate to make room for the new food, and the parasite pops out in the, in the defecation, and then people scratch, and, the, and when they scratch, they, they put the, the trypanosome, the parasite, into their blood. And uh, so there's, there's been a lot more, uh, this has been a lot more on the radar as, as, as uh, scientists have realized that there's a lot more cases uh, than, than we have ever suspected. Plus, of course, now that we realize it's transmitting in the United States, um, there's a lot more concern. Now, unfortunately, there was a little bit of a bias historically with this disease. It was seen as an immigrant disease and not our problem kind of thing, at least in the States. Um, and uh, now they're realizing that, you know, it is these, these insects and transmission is found in subtropical locations. So that includes places like Florida and I believe even Texas. And of course, uh, so people are concerned about this and, and, and trying to figure out what to, what to do about it. Uh, not everyone has severe symptoms. Some people do, though. It's kind of one of those things that, uh, you know, eventually if it gets into your heart or something like that, it can be fatal. But that doesn't happen to everybody. Some people, it just stays in the blood and doesn't get into crucial tissues, maybe causes arthritis and things like that, but uh, maybe not fatal. Um, very high percentage of people are probably not even diagnosed. So this is something that's on the radar and, uh, and going to become more important uh, as we learn more about it, for sure. Okay, so like I said, Chagas disease and African sleeping sickness um, these are not Canadian diseases other than cases that are imported from people that are traveling from other countries. 
but they're important geographically, and uh, and uh, they are examples of vector-borne diseases, meaning they're spread by some sort of uh, insect or arthropod. Um, there is one disease that is uh, much more important than these. Okay, here we go. I'm just trying to. My PowerPoint is slow. I press the button and then it doesn't change the slide. And I press the button again and it keeps changing it. So I need to see if I can get on the slide I want to get on. There we go. That's the one. Um, so I want to shift and talk about uh, uh, malaria, which is which is arguably much more important than both uh, African sleeping sickness and Chagas disease. Um, Malaria is caused by the uh, plasmodium parasite, which falls into a group of parasites called the Apa complexa. So let me just explain what that is first, because uh, there's a couple organisms that are important with Apa complexes. Um, these organisms have an organelle called an apical complex. So you can see from this slide here, it's, it's mentioning that, they, that the apical complex, uh, let me circle that for you a special organelle for penetrating host cells. So I have a picture of one here for you. You can kind of think of this as a enzymatic and mechanical drill. Uh, so it's, it's used for penetrating host cells. And so these organisms can live inside host cells, which makes them uh, a little easier for them to evade your immune system. But really the whole idea here is to penetrate the host cells and get access to some sort of nutrient. So the malaria organism falls into this category as well as uh, something called toxoplasma, which I'll talk about in a moment. So here's the malaria parasite. It's called plasmodium. So you need to know the word malaria and plasmodium. Uh, there are actually five species that cause malaria in humans. Um, I, I don't need you to know all the names of the species, just know plasmodium. The big one, plasmodium falciparum. Um, I don't know what percentage, I think it's like 85% of malaria cases worldwide are that one. Uh, Plasmodium vivax um, is a bit more common in South America, so that's, you know, maybe 10% uh, maybe or something like that, and the others are, are much more minor. Uh, Plasmodium falciparum uh, also tends to be, uh, give more serious disease and kills more people. Um, so this is the picture I showed before, by the way, and kind of the, the take home message from this is that it's spread by mosquito. And I'll talk about that mosquito in a minute. You can see it's getting into the blood, uh, it's infecting the liver, it's infecting the blood. And uh, as part of that life cycle, what happens is it destroys red blood cells. And as those red blood cells get destroyed, people end up with these fevers. And, and so kind of a characteristic uh, symptom of malaria is you get these fevers kind of regularly every two to three days, kind of depending on the organism in your body, now, as those red blood cells break open. So fevers and chills and a whole bunch of other symptoms are, are, are possible. So some of you may are thinking a little bit about malaria. I know that um, um, if you've lived in Canada all your life, you've probably never had malaria. It doesn't transmit in Canada, or at least hasn't in something like 150, 200 years. Uh, it, it used to, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but some, some of you may be from, from uh, an African country or from India where uh, malaria is, is relatively common. And uh, I know people have different views about how serious malaria is. Uh, if you get malaria as an adult, not usually that serious. Uh, in some countries, people are getting malaria two, three times every rainy season. And, uh, you know, you, you get sick for a few days and then that's kind of the end of it. Um, much more serious if you're a young child. So the number of cases of malaria annually, uh, I think officially are around 300 million. Unofficially, it's probably closer to a billion uh, cases of malaria annually. And, um, uh, you know, if you're just a, a normal human, uh, the, the chance of dying is maybe one in 100, one in 200. So do the math, right? If there's 300 million cases, uh, then there's probably, uh, you know, 100 million deaths from malaria. If there's a billion cases, uh, there's probably a lot more. And most of those deaths are young children in impoverished countries. So this is why malaria is, is very serious, because uh, there are a lot of, a lot of children uh, dying from it. And uh, the other thing is, too, if these children are getting in, they can't go to school, it's delaying their education. And, and of course, this is not helping uh, developing countries. So malaria is an important scourge of the developing world. Um, again, this is a disease that's tropical, subtropical, and thankfully we don't have uh, 
I don't have the disease in, in Canada, um, but it's very, very serious uh, worldwide. And, uh, you know, this is one of these things that, you know, if we, could, if we could do something about it, we could certainly help a lot of people in these countries. Um, so somebody is saying, is malaria passed from person to person or just transmitted by mosquito? Uh, turns out both. Uh, usually the usual transmission is by mosquito. Uh, so the mosquito bites a person and then, you know, carries that blood and, and brings it to the next person. Uh, it can be transmitted, though, by, by blood transfusion, uh, which is why if you donate blood, they ask if you've had malaria, if you've had uh, plasmodium vivax, they may not let you donate blood at all because it can, uh, it can live in a person's liver for, for many years as well. Someone is making a comment about anti-malarial drugs, and yeah, there are, there are quite a few uh, anti-malarial drugs. Some of them work better than others, and again, it depends on the organism. There is resistance. And, uh, it's a pretty complicated uh, issue, anti-malarial drugs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about them when we get to our, our unit on drugs. Uh, I think I had a, a couple of pictures and a short video here for you. Um, there's the malarial parasite. So notice it has that pointy end, that's the apical complex, and it's invading this uh, red blood cell. It likes to get in and, and gets at the hemoglobin, by the way. That's what it feeds on, hemoglobin, uh, the protein in there. Uh, so here's a little video. Uh, I think this is maybe 60 seconds, kind of just a very quick overview of the plasmodium life cycle. So I'll play that for you right now. The malaria parasite's life cycle is very... Oh, sorry about that. Just want to make sure I have volume. Go back, start right at the beginning again. Site's life cycle is very complex, involving many stages. As the mosquito feeds, malaria sporozoites enter into the human bloodstream. They quickly make their way to the liver and infect liver cells with the help of the circumsporozoic protein. The parasite develops into mature schizons, creating tens of thousands of merozoites, which burst out of the cell and journey back toward the bloodstream. They then infect healthy red blood cells, reproducing and eventually rupturing the cell, liberating more merozoite, which in turn go on to infect other cells, leading to the massive destruction of red blood cells. A few of the infected cells develop into gametocytes, which can remain in the bloodstream for several days and may be ingested by another mosquito during a subsequent feeding. Inside the mosquito, the gametocytes develop into new sporozoites. So now the human has infected the mosquito, the life cycle comes full circle and continues. Okay, so I just want to say a couple of things about these mosquitoes. Um, the mosquito that causes malaria is called the Anopheles mosquito. You can see it's right here on this slide, Anopheles. Uh, there's a little brochure made by Dr. Seuss about and an Anopheles mosquito. This was made for uh, troops in Vietnam, I believe. Uh, so I thought I would, I would show that to you. So some of you are probably wondering if I'm traveling, what is my risk of getting malaria? Uh, kind of depends. Kind of depends on where you're going. Depends on how many times you're going to get bitten. Um, if you're in an area that has malaria, uh, I think the stats are something like one in every 200 mosquitoes might have the parasite. So if you're going to get bitten like 200 times, and that's, and that's possible. I had a friend who, um, he lived in Zambia for a year, and uh, so he was not African. Uh, he was uh, you know, born and bred Canadian, and uh, of course he had malaria, I think he said several times, because he was just being bitten constantly during the rainy season. Um, but, you know, something to, to watch out for is if you, uh, you know, if you're in one of these locations and you see some mosquitoes, and the mosquitoes kind of, you know, they, they crouch like this. There's my little mosquito. Hopefully you like my, my diagram. The Anopheles mosquitoes are crouches at an angle. So if you see an Anopheles mosquito, that's, that's what it looks like. Uh, a lot of other mosquitoes kind of crouch like, like this. So maybe you don't need to worry about malaria, but then again, maybe you need to worry about Zika or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, you do have to usually get bitten uh, quite a few times in order to, to get malaria. Um, and uh, there, are other, uh, there are other mitigating uh, things that people do. If, if you are in an area that, that uh, 
uh, it does have a high amount of, of malaria. Um, somebody had mentioned anti-malarial drugs before. There are, uh, sometimes people will take the drugs preventively. So for example, uh, this drug called mefloquine, and you take one pill a week, and it's supposed to uh, help prevent you from, from getting malaria. Um, you know, people will, will dress up and, and, you know, use clothes and, and repellents. And, uh, you know, a lot of places will have, of course, uh, mosquito nets that you could buy or use if, if they're in high areas. And so that's something that a lot of um, these uh, um, organizations like World Vision, for example, if any of you have ever been involved in like buying, uh, you know, those World Vision has a, has a Christmas catalog every year where you can buy gifts for people in, uh, in developing countries. And so one of the things uh, that you can buy for people are mosquito nets. And um, so these mosquitoes like to bite in the evenings and at night. And so you sleep under these mosquito nets that, that fold over your entire bed. And uh, if you can afford a mosquito net or get one uh, gifted to you, uh, then uh, it can actually prevent a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, spread of, of malaria. Um, another thing that can be done, which, you know, seems really trivial, uh, is have screens in your windows. Uh, this is something that people can't afford worldwide, necessarily everywhere. And again, it you know, depends on the number of mosquitoes. In Canada, we have screens in our windows and you get a few mosquitoes in through the door. And so it's, it's not a big deal. I know you're thinking how nasty those things are, but the amount of mosquitoes in Canada compared to some of these uh, 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 warmer countries where it's raining all the time uh, is nothing, it's trivial. Unless you're from Manitoba, I'm not from Manitoba, but I did camp there once, and those mosquitoes are absolutely legendary. You would not believe how nasty that weekend was. Um, see, there's some comments, questions. People are mentioning something about um, mosquito nets, and somebody wants to exterminate these things for good. I agree. I think we could make a pretty good case to get rid of mosquitoes uh, forever, um, considering all the diseases that they're transmitting. I would, I would love, love to see us get rid of mosquitoes. Okay, so that is plasmodium. Don't forget that word. We've got plasmodium causes malaria spread by mosquito. So that's a good one to know. We're going to talk about plasmodium quite a bit. Like I said, it's a really important disease worldwide. So back to what's going on in Canada. There's another apica, apa complexa um, that is a very important parasite found in Canada, and this is called Toxoplasma gondii. So you can see in my note there, it says, this may be the world's most successful parasite. Um, we're not really sure, but there is a number of studies that seem to indicate that maybe 50% of the world's population is infected. 50%, think about that. That's like half of everybody you know. Although in Canada, it seems that the numbers are, are, uh, are a little bit lower. I was looking for some data on Canada. I found two studies, two studies, one said maybe 10%, one said maybe 25%. Um, we just don't know. Uh, again, this is one of these cases where we have a disease and, and, and or, or, or sorry, a parasite, and a lot of people don't have symptoms. So what is this one all about? You may have heard of it. Um, Toxo comes up uh, in conversations uh, when people are pregnant, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And so this is another organism that forms a cyst. So let me just talk about uh, the kind of the transmission life cycle of this thing. This is actually a cat-mouse disease uh, for the most part. I just see there's a question there. Is this cat sc scratch fever? No, cat scratch fever is a bacterium uh, that lives on cats and we can get it from scratches. So this is actually a different, uh, different disease. So if you take a look, this is a, a cat-mouse kind of thing that's going on here. So you have a cat, and the cat uh, gets the parasite, and the parasite comes out in a cyst form in a species. And, uh, you know, mice are scurrying around, and they, they, uh, they get some uh, of the parasite, and uh, the parasite goes into the mouse, uh, ends up in the mouse tissue, and, of course, the cat eats the mouse and gets the parasite, and it kind of goes around and around. So there's a couple things to say about, uh, about toxoplasma. It's a very, very interesting parasite because, um, if you think about what a mouse normally does when it smells a cat, it experiences fear. So this parasite here actually can get into the mouse's brain and makes the mouse like the smell of cat. In fact, it's the same part of the brain that has to do with sexual arousal 
kind of scary, isn't it? Um, so now you have this parasite that's controlling the mouse brain and actually tells it, hey, I like cats. And so this parasite is very good at repropagating itself. So why is this parasite so successful? Um, well, it turns out that these cysts can actually infect almost anything um, that's a mammal. Um, it's found all over the place. Cats, of course, are found everywhere worldwide, uh, and they're pooping everywhere. And, uh, and the, these cysts can, can be just about anywhere. You can see uh, they can end up in herbivores. They can end up contaminating vegetables and gardens. Um, and of course, if you have a pet cat, uh, it can end up with toxoplasma and you may be handling its feces if you're cleaning up the litter box. So for humans, for the most part, um, we have very good immune systems. Uh, it's not usually getting into our brain and these, uh, um, these little parasites, they end up in our bodies and, and our, our immune cells just sort of package them up and that's kind of the end of the story, um, usually. Okay, so there's a connection about pregnant women, and if you get pregnant, um, your doctor or midwife, uh, you know, they'll probably ask you, do you have a cat? And because what they don't want you to do is handling that cat feces. Now, why is that? Because our fetuses don't have good immune systems. In fact, depending on the stage you get infected, uh, then we don't even have an immune system yet. And this can be very, very dangerous to the fetus if the fetus gets a toxoplasma infection. This is one of these diseases, not all diseases can do this. This can actually travel across the placenta, infect the fetus, and uh, there can be very serious uh, growth abnormalities and uh, um, uh, mental uh, developmental delays and, and all sorts of things that happen to the fetus. Um, if the woman has already had toxoplasma before she gets pregnant, she's usually okay. But then again, they don't usually test. They just say, just stay away from the cat feces. And, uh, and hopefully and, and things should be, should be fine. Um, so you can see there's another note that sometimes in cases, sometimes people get it, get it through blood transfusion. Other case where toxoplasma is very serious is if you have some sort of uh, immune issue. So HIV or maybe an organ transplant, uh, so your immune system is, is, is not there. And, uh, and, and then at this point, the, the parasite can actually start growing and, and cause issues. In some cases, those issues aren't serious. You know, people are getting fever and swollen lymph glands. In other cases, it can get into the brain and cause some, cause some issues. Okay, so, so let's, let's go back to this, this cat and mouse thing. Because I'm sure a number of you people are thinking, okay, um, I like cats. And maybe your like of cats is, is, un is unhealthy. Some people really like cats. So you're probably thinking, okay, now do I have toxoplasma and do I like cats because I'm infected with toxoplasma? And I know a lot of people are very concerned about this because it's like, holy cow, um, there's a cat parasite controlling me. And, you know, I only have four cats, but you know, that, is that normal? Um, I have a friend who has four cats and uh, you know, I joke with him about toxoplasma and so on. It's the same friend that has the two dogs and he's the biologist. So, you know, I can joke to him about parasites. Um, the answer is we, we, we don't know fully. We, do, we don't think so. We think that our brain chemistry is different from, from a mouse brain chemistry. Uh, and, and so we don't think that we like cats because we are infected with toxoplasma. At least the research doesn't seem to show a correlation between those kind of things. Um, but there are interesting correlations between people who are infected with toxoplasma and, and certain types of mental uh, disease. Um, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, you're like slightly more likely to get schizophrenia and bipolar disorder if you have toxoplasma. Um, not a huge amount, but just a little bit. If you have toxoplasma, it doesn't mean you're going to get schizophrenia. It just means you're slightly more likely. Um, there's a bunch of other studies that show all these weird correlations. It turns out that women who are infected with toxoplasma are actually slightly better drivers. They get into slightly less accidents, and men who are infected with toxoplasma get into slightly more car accidents. So there, there's probably a little bit of brain chemistry stuff going on. Um, but again, these are, are kind of weak correlations, and, and there's still a lot of questions around this. Uh, the strongest correlation actually has to do with schizophrenia. Uh, and, uh, and so that's something that people are concerned about and wondering whether if we treat people for toxoplasma, is going to help them with their uh, maybe not develop schizophrenia. Again, schizophrenia has a lot of other um, uh, possible correlations and causes, you know, genetics and things like that are into play. So it's, it's a very complicated issue, but 
something very interesting. Uh, if you Google uh, something like, is my cat making me crazy, you'll find uh, articles all over the internet uh, about toxoplasma. Uh, take them all with a grain of salt. Okay, I don't fully believe the research is there other than showing some weak correlations. Uh, but uh, there, there certainly are some interesting studies done on toxoplasma and human brains. Okay, so there's something else to think about and go home with. Um, yeah, so there's just kind of what I said. Uh, links between migraines, seizure disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, epilepsy, some cancers, car accidents, schizophrenia, increased rates of suicides. Um, take them all with a grain of salt. <laughs> We're still trying to sort this out. Um, don't get rid of your cat just yet. Uh, you know, they are kind of cute and they're, they're nice companions. Okay, we're going to talk about a couple other protists, and then I have a kahoot for you. You can load up your app in a moment. Um, one other uh, apicoplexa that is important to mention is this one here. It's called cryptosporidium. So this is an apicoplexa. That means it can, it can uh, invade cells. Uh, this can cause uh, chlorine-resistant cysts. So it's kind of like Giardia in that it can be resistant to water treatment. Uh, this one is associated a bit more with uh, cow manure, uh, but it can be spread from human to human. And, uh, and this is another reason why your town might have a boil water advisory. Uh, so you can see, uh, again, causing diarrhea. This is kind of usually the case when people get some sort of gastrointestinal infection. Uh, it's getting in your gut, it's causing diarrhea or vomiting or both or cramps or something along that lines to do with your gut, right? Uh, so kind of the, the key message to take away from cryptosporidium is it's resistant to chlorination, and they're uh, usually associated with, uh, with cow feces, but uh, sometimes other animals, you can see in this case here, um, it looks like we have a kid in a swimming pool. And there have been cases where swimming pools had to get shut down because some kid gets in there with diarrhea and they're concerned about cryptosporidium because it can survive the chlorination uh, of a pool. And of course, you know, uh, as much as you're trying not to drink the pool water, uh, you know, I'm sure you ingest a little bit when you're swimming in there, um, particularly kids in general, which are always more susceptible to these kind of diseases. So one other cyst forming thing are the amoeba. So there's a video for you. Actually, I took this video. This is a video of amoeba we are looking at in the biology lab. This one here is not uh, pathogenic. Um, there's a whole bunch of different types of amoeba out there. And, and what these amoeba can do is they can, they can move around by, by moving their cytoplasm. They can actually change the shape of their, of their cell bodies. And uh, they're very cool to look at. You can see that one right there. Um, and uh, they, uh, those, those projections are called pseudopodia. So you take apart that word pseudopodia. Pseudo means fake or false. And podia means foot or feet, right? So they're making these fake feet and they can, they can grab things. And that's, that's just how they move around and how they, how they feed. And you can see on the left, there's a, um, an image there of, uh, of uh, an amoeba that's grabbing onto a paramecium and feeding on it, right? So the one, uh, one of the ones we're concerned about amoeba is called Entamoeba histolytica. So this here is uh, less common in Canada than Giardia but has sort of a similar life cycle. It's forming the cysts and we're talking about contaminated drinking water. It tends to be a little more associated with uh, warmer areas. Uh, so again, subtropical and, and, and United States, um, but it does happen in Canada uh, once in a while and causes amoebic dysentery. So you can see that word there, dysentery. Oops, hold on. It's gonna circle it. There we go, dysentery. So you may hear about dysentery if you ever watch like World War I movies and they're in the trenches and people are getting dysentery or they're dying of it. Uh, it, it just, it means bloody diarrhea. So it's a little different from Giardia. Giardia, you're not getting bloody diarrhea. In this case, you're getting bloody diarrhea. Contaminated drinking water, um, usually can, you know, a little bit more uh, associated, like I said, with warmer locations, but it does happen in the, you know, cases do happen in Canada once in a while. You may have noticed my next slide with a little cartoon for you. And a little far side cartoon and they're in the lab and they're doing something they shouldn't be doing and they're drinking and eating in the lab and he says what this is lemonade where's my culture of amoebic dysentery uh, there's a good one 
Uh, I see there's a question someone's asking about are leeches pathogenic? Uh, not really, they're, they're parasites, they suck your blood, but they're not, they're not uh, as far as I know, transmitting any, any disease other than getting a little bit of a flesh wound from the, from the suction of the blood. <laughs> So I just want to share with you uh, that there are other amoebas out there, and thankfully um, most of them are rare, uh, rare diseases. This one here is something that uh, I would say once a year I see something about this in the news, people uh, getting uh, an eye infection from this type of amoeba. It's called a camp amoeba. Uh, usually the scenario here is you have some sort of teenager, and the teenager is too cheap to buy him or herself uh, some proper sterilization fluid for his or her contact lenses, so they're just using tap water. Don't do that. Buy the proper sterilization fluid. Tap water is not 100% pure, and sometimes there's these little amoeba that live in there, and they get onto the plastic, and then they can get into the eyeball, and I'm just giving you a warning right now, there's kind of a graphic picture, so watch out. So here's the, uh, here's the picture of what can happen to that eyeball is they can get an eyeball infection and this uh, can cause vision loss and, and that's not good. Uh, so like I said, you read about some of these rare amoebas every once in a while out there. There's another one called a brain eating amoeba and there's about like one case in the United States a year uh, and uh, there's a few other out there and, and they're all similar in that they crawl around by moving their, uh, uh, their cytoplasm. Okay, so here's a case study and then we'll do a Kahoot. Um, so it says here, we have a 41-year-old patient. She was visiting family in Uganda, and before admittance to the hospital, she noted acute onsets of fevers and chills, as well as a cough. And for the past three days, she's had episodes of fevers and chills about three times a day. So when you look at these case studies, there, there's always a lot of clues in there, and you can see that uh, I'm not just looking at the symptoms. The symptoms in this case, in my mind, are very obvious. She has fevers and chills. That should be a, a dead giveaway for malaria. But the other thing that's a dead giveaway for malaria is visiting family in Uganda. So Uganda is in Africa, and Africa is, of course, um, a hot spot for malaria. Uh, in fact, a very high percentage of the malaria cases worldwide are, are in the African continent, uh, particularly during the rainy seasons, right? So this is malaria. So what should the patient be immediately tested for? Uh, definitely uh, malaria. Uh, there's a few different tests, but the classical test is they take a blood test and they do what's called a blood smear, and the technician will stain it, and you can see those little blue things. So I'm looking at uh, these little blue things right here. Um, those are uh, indicative of a plasmodium parasite. It says, what factors put this individual at risk for infection? Mostly geography. And uh, in, in time of year, like I said, uh, if, if you go and it's the dry season, your risk of getting bitten by mosquitoes is minimal. Um, but if you go during the, uh, the rainy season and there's mosquitoes everywhere, uh, that, that's a big risk factor here. So someone says a malaria endemic region, yes. So geography, like I said. Always something to look up. Okay, so, you know, what is the disease burden of these things? Um, huge. Uh, you can see amoebiasis, so that's uh, uh, the um, amoeba histolytica, you know, we're looking at maybe 600 million cases a year. Malaria, those numbers, every time I look them up, the, the official numbers are two to 300 million, but uh, some people are estimating more like half a billion to a billion. Uh, Giardia, a couple hundred million per year. Uh, the trypanosomes uh, a little bit lower, but uh, again, you don't know the numbers of Chagas disease very well. Okay, so I have a Kahoot for you. So hopefully you've loaded up the app. I'm going to uh, share a few questions with you here. Okay, where is it? Oops, okay. Well, there we go. Okay, here we go. I'll load this up. Okay, give you about another 30 seconds to join.
Okay, give you about another 10 seconds if you want to join. You can always join in partway through. It gives the uh, game code at the bottom of the screen. Okay, here we go. Brodists. Question one, what are cilia used for? Okay, so the correct answer is motility in swimming. So it looks like most of you got that one right. You can see there's a photograph here of uh, all the cilia on this protist. And like I said, think of them as little fingers or little tiny thors. It's another way to think of them. All right, next question. Let's see how the points came out. Jaden in the weed, just barely, watch out. Question two, true or false? Giardia lamblia is a common cause of traveler's diarrhea. Okay, the answer is true. Not as common as E. coli, but it is a common form of traveler's diarrhea. There's kind of a, a big list of organisms that are probable causes, and Giardia is, I would say, maybe number three on that list. And that's the type of traveler's diarrhea you might have if you have that diarrhea for, you know, two weeks or more. So if you have that, go get some treatment. Um, treatment is pretty easy. It's just a few pills that kill the parasite. Okay, Jaden's still in the lead. Watch out for Jared. Question three, plasmodium parasites are transmitted by. That is right, mosquito. So plasmodium is the organism that causes malaria. Okay, so those other ones, uh, uh, tsetse fly, kissing bugs, can only drink water, those um, are referring to different organisms we were just talking about. Ooh, shaking things up with the score. One more question. Toxoplasma gondii. Okay, so this one was a little harder. I didn't put the obvious answer. Toxoplasma is the one transmitted by cat feces. Uh, I made this one a little bit harder. I had to read it and think about it. This is not usually harmful to those with healthy immune systems. That is correct. So like I said, maybe 50% of the world's population has it, uh, and most people are not experiencing symptoms. Their immune system is keeping it in check. But if you have some sort of immune difficulty, such as HIV, or you're getting a uh, uh, an organ transplant, uh, and having toxoplasma can be a big risk. Or if you were a fetus, that is another area where you are a risk. So let's see how the score comes out. Ray, third, bronze. Jody, silver, and gold medal, Naomi. Okay, good work. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. I can see we're just running out of time, so we'll probably have to talk about fungi mostly next week. Uh, maybe I will introduce them and then and then save the rest of the fungi for, I mean, next third, or not next week, on Thursday. Um, so let's talk about the fungi, okay? So the fungi, uh, study of fungi is known as mycology. So anytime you see M, Y, C in something, um, that usually has something to do with a fungi, right? Uh, so mycology, uh, 
just trying to think of another word. Um, can't think of one at the moment, but you do see them sometimes in the in the uh, in, in the scientific words. Um, so what are fungi? Well, there's thousands and thousands of species. Many of them have not actually been characterized at all. Uh, a lot of them are good. Uh, you know, if you like to eat mushrooms and truffles and things like that, um, there's lots of good mushrooms out there that are part of our diet. Um, yeast are also fungi as well, and of course we use them to make bread and wine and things like that. And, and there's a lot of people that use uh, yeast as part of uh, uh, genetics research. Some of them actually make drugs for us, so things like penicillin are made by a fungi called penicillium. Uh, so there's lots of useful products from fungi. What's the bad? Um, turns out a lot of these things are decomposers and or parasites, means they live on plants and animals. Um, the biggest concern for fungi for humans actually is crop diseases. They're, you know, they, they will wreck entire fields of crops and wheat and things like that. And um, there are a few uh, uh, human diseases. Uh, most of them are discomfort. Some of them are a little more serious, and we'll talk about those, I guess, on, on Thursday. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What's the ugly? Um, food spoilage, allergies, and you can see hallucinant and drugs. I guess you could call that good or ugly, depending on, on where you, uh, uh, what you're thinking about hallucinogenic drugs. Um, I want to share this with you. I was learning about this um, fungus. They call it the humongous fungus. Uh, maybe the largest living organism on the planet. This thing is like huge. You can see it's like 9.65 square kilometers. It's mostly underground. Uh, and so it was nicknamed the humongous fungus and found in Oregon. So I thought that was kind of cool. So thousands of species, many are decomposers. Uh, we talked a little bit about their biology. They have a cell wall made of chitin and uh, many have never actually been characterized uh, for, for fungi. Um, they reproduce sexually, sometimes asexually. Uh, there's a lot of weird things going on with fungal biology, and much is not even worth getting into uh, because it can get very, very complicated. Uh, here's showing them as decomposers. So fungi, by the way, are actually biologically a lot more like animals than plants. And uh, what do I mean by that? In that plants are photosynthetic, right? They make their own food. Uh, animals and fungi eat other things. Uh, we just do it slightly differently. Animals, we ingest our food, bring it into our gut, and, uh, and eat it there. Fungi do the opposite. They actually secrete their enzymes and kind of digest things externally. So you can see that picture on the left. You're seeing a mushroom, and you've got all these little uh, finger-like cells uh, that, that grow out of it. And these little structures are called um, hyphae. So these are little finger-like things that, that uh, uh, secrete enzymes. And if you have a bunch of hyphae, they're called mycelium. So I'll come back to those words next day. So maybe what I will do is I will just finish today with my fungi joke. So uh, my one joke I know about fungi, and it's, it's, a, it's a bad one, but um, you know, I got to tell it once a year just to get everyone to that like fungi a little more, and so it goes something like this: You've got this uh, this mushroom, and he's uh, you know he's in a bar, and he's he's trying to uh, you know pick up this attractive uh, young lady, and uh, you know he, he comes up to her and says, "Hey, can I buy you a drink?" And she says, "Are you kidding me? No way!" And he says, "Come on, I'm a fun guy, uh -huh, fun guy. Uh -huh, hopefully you get it." Anyway, I'm going to finish there uh, with the joke, and um, I will see you on. Thursday. I see there's some questions or maybe people are just laughing. <laughs> yes, so thanks for laughing at my jokes. It does make my day. So have a wonderful day. I will see you on Thursday. Uh, feel free to email me any questions if you like and we'll pick up where we left off on Thursday and we'll also talk about worms. So bring a strong stomach on Thursday. All right, well have a great day. See you later.